In this video, we begin what I kind of consider to be the important part behind our balance sheet and our income statement, and that is analyzing these two documents to try to figure out what the implications are for our business, what these numbers mean. And one thing that we always try to do is we try to compare our numbers to something else. We have to externally validate these numbers. And what do I mean by that? I mean, you need to have some information, some data on industry standards and compare your balance sheet to those industry standards, or you need to look at your balance sheet and your income statement over time to see how the information on these two financial documents is changing because your goal is to gradually improve the business over time. So I've put together a couple of documents. The first one here is a comparative balance sheet for Deaton's Angus Meats. And I've named this business after uh, Angus Deaton, the uh, Nobel Prize winning economist. And it's just a balance sheet. This one's a little bit different because it is a stacked balance sheet. It's not side by side. That's a term I made up just now. I don't think there's a thing called a stacked balance sheet. It's just a balance sheet. And we've stacked it where the assets are listed first. And then instead of listing the liabilities and equity off to the right, we've got the liabilities and equity listed below the assets. So just kind of be aware that it's perfectly acceptable to create your balance sheet so that it's stacked like that. It doesn't have to be a right left. It could be a top bottom. And the interesting and important thing here is that we've got two documents combined into one. We have the balance sheet for the end of the year 2030 and the end of the year 2031. So we can look at the cash and the other assets and the notes payable and the other liabilities and the equity side by side and compare the changes. And since we got them side by side, it's real simple just to calculate the difference. And what we see has happened is that our cash position has grown from $86,000 up to a quarter of a million dollars for a difference of $164,000. We just subtracted. There's the formula. It is the 2031 number minus the 2030 number. And then we can calculate a difference as a percentage. So I'll double click on that to show you the formula. It's just the difference divided by the starting number in 2030, the December 31st, 2030 number. And what we see is that our cash has grown by 191%. So remember, 100% is doubling. So we have had a massive increase in our cash position. And when you see a big change like that, you should probably be asking why exactly what has happened to change this cash position. We might see a part of that in the next line. In the next line, we originally had three quarters of a million dollars in accounts receivable. And uh, now we have 1.2 million. Well, that doesn't explain a darn thing because that means we have less cash, right? Maybe the next line tells us something. It's our inventories. Our inventories were 5.6 million. Now they're 2.8 million. I'm obviously rounding the numbers. And we see a major decrease in our inventory. It amounts to a 50% drop in inventory, which is around $2.8 million, almost $3 million drop in this asset. And the thing about inventory, its current asset, the purpose of inventory is to turn it into something else. Specifically, you want it to become a cash. So what I think has gone on here is that we had too much inventory sitting around at the end of 2030. And we flipped that inventory. We turned it and we converted that inventory into a different asset, accounts receivable, and a different asset, cash. So we see this massive drop in inventories. And that massive drop in inventories led to a big decrease in our current assets. We see a similar thing going on here when we total up all of our assets. Our total assets has dropped by 10%. And you might look at that and say, well, that's a bad thing. We had a $3.7 million drop in our assets. Well, who's to say that's a bad thing? Because we used those assets to maybe pay down some debt, right? And we turned this massive inventory into a much smaller inventory. I still think holding $2.8 million in inventory, what is that? That's, that's huge, right? That's a pretty big inventory. Um, that's, a, that's, a, that's a big percentage of our sales. That's over 10% of our sales is being held in inventory. And, and so we've lowered that inventory number, and we've increased our cash position, and our total assets are down 10%. And the thing to remember is that number down 10%, negative 10, may be a bad thing, right? It could be a horrible thing, but you've got to compare it to the rest of the numbers. Let's scroll on down and check out our liabilities. Our total liabilities 
uh, that's down 18%. So our assets decreased, but our liabilities decreased more than our assets. So that's got to be a good thing, right? Um, hopefully, um, that's an indication that we're better off than we were. Um, the equity uh, dropped by 1%. There's lots of things that influence that equity. It's, it's down by 1%. And we look at the total liabilities and equity, and we see that the total liabilities and equity are down by 10% to $3.7 million drop. And what you're going to notice is these numbers right here balance out. We're down 10% in assets. We've got to be down for 10% in equity and liabilities. And what I really want to point out is our total liabilities, here we go, it's down 18%. Um, hey, that's a good thing, right? If your assets drop 10% and your liabilities drop 18%, you ought to be coming ahead. Uh, now, why the equity is down 1% beats the heck out of me. It just happens to be that way. But we have this great document where we can compare the two years and kind of see what kind of progress we're making inside this inside this business. And hey, we're, we're paying down debt, we're turning over inventory. That sounds pretty reasonable to me. We do the same thing with our income statement. We've got, and it's set up a little bit differently. There's many different ways you can set these up. We have the year ending December 31st, 2030, the end of the first year. We have the year ending December 31st, 2031, the end of the second year. Now, the other thing that we do is we take all of our numbers on our income statement and we break it down to a percent of sales. That's a very common thing to do. And that's really handy when you're looking at things like gross margin and profit as a percent of sales, expenses as a percent of sales, that kind of thing. Pretty normal thing to do to look at things in terms of percentage of sales. So obviously, our revenue is 100% of our sales. We have our cost of goods sold and the section where we calculate that and we learn that our cost of goods sold is 47% of sales. And the next year, it's 51% of sales. We have a gross margin. Here, the gross margin is 52% of sales. That means for every dollar in revenue in 2030, we had 52 cents left over after we paid for our goods we were selling that we can now use to cover our expenses and turn into profit. And in 2031, we see that number is lower. We've only got 48 cents left over. Well, 48 cents per dollar is not as good as 52 cents per dollar. We have less money as a percentage of sales to cover all of our other items we have to cover. So we've got a big old long list of operating expenses. Uh, and we told the operating expenses and we find that our operating expenses is 48% of our sales in the first year and 45% of our sales in the second year. And our income before taxes is 3.72% of sales versus 3.42% of sales. So we did a little bit worse job of turning our income or our, excuse me, our revenue into profits. That's what this means. Profit was 3.72% of our gross revenue, our total revenue, and then it's 3.42%. Now, the thing to notice is profits actually went up. We had uh, just shy of a million, and then we turned that uh, into 1.1 million the next year. So profits went up, but profits as a percentage of sales went down. We back out the taxes, and finally, we have a net income and a net income as a percentage of sales. Once again, same story. After we paid our taxes, we had slightly more than three quarters of a million dollars in profit. Uh, the second year, we've got $900,000 in profit, and we see that was 3% of total sales, and then down to 2.73%. So although we made more money, we are less effective at turning our revenue into profits. And that's an, kind of an important thing to take into consideration. There's a whole lot to go over as we analyze these documents. And I'm going to break this into several videos. So I'm going to go ahead and stop this particular video right here. And make sure that you hit subscribe so that when I pop the next one up, you're not going to miss it. Thank you so much for listening.